I got trolled, I got a troll, I'm gonna get to do a mailbag. <laughs> meat sack. What? Hey meat sack, it looks like we had a problem with the last video. Okay, what's the problem? We've had a couple people that seem to be a little bit confused about this male-female energy thing. Yeah, I was kind of worried about that when I pulled out that section of the TED Talk. I had to, though. I got a content match. So how would you put on that goofy-ass hat of yours and discuss it properly? Better yet, I'll put on the shaman hat and make it a panel discussion. How does that sound? Okay, boss. We got the hangout all set. One of my recent videos was talking about the notion of male and female energies as it's promoted within the New Age movement. It's a really bizarre and, I think, kind of, well, sexist way of looking at things from just about all angles. There are certain stereotypes that have been brought forward from days of old, we'll just refer to it as. And this breakdown of these supposed energies um, can be seen very well in how it's presented by the New Age movement. The way that they present it is that male energy has been dominant in our society and we need to raise up our female energy as opposed to bringing them both up to equal levels. It's this kind of weird back and forth. Now, one way that they parse it out is, quote, quote, we are going through this profound shift. Many individuals are experiencing a deep inner change as well, yada, yada, yada. And it says men must be less controlling and more allowing. Women be more assertive without sacrificing their warmth and softness. It seems to lay down a much stronger notion of genders and what the gender is supposed to represent. The properties that they ascribe to each, uh, and I'm going to go from one column to the other, masculine doing, feminine, being, masculine, masculine, aggression, feminine, surrender. And it keeps going down the list with analytical versus um, intuitive, concrete versus abstract, impatient versus patient, striving versus tranquil, rushing versus nurturing, assertive versus receptive. And these seem to really, as far as I'm concerned, just further the old standard stereotypes that we see. What we've learned over the course of the last decade is that gender and what it is to be male and female is much broader, much more intricate, and much more fluid than was once thought. And these, this is old thought here. Instead of simply accepting that there is this masculine and feminine nature of us, which they're trying to do to some degree, they're then taking this to say, you are male, therefore you fit these criteria. You are female, you fit these criteria. And I've heard people within the New Age movement urge people to try and accept some of the qualities from the other, whether it's appropriate or not. But then when somebody is showing themselves to be more masculine and more feminine, when it doesn't agree with their gender, then they will claim that they have a surplus or too much or are imbalanced in terms of these two essences. Well, I'm screwed. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm, I'm far more analytical than intuitive. Yeah. And the thing is, they would this would be parsed out by them claiming that you have too much male energy and you need to embrace more of your female energy, regardless of that's what par that's part of makes you who you are. And that's ridiculous. And I know that then some people would go, well, of course you've got male energy. You're a lesbian. No, I'm sorry, I'm a lesbian because I have female energy. Um, in, in the sense that I am a female and I have energy, not that there is a certain thing called female energy. You got a surplus um, of energy. Period. I've been, I've dealt with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. There you go. There you go. I've got enough energy to power a city. Um, <laughs> hey, well, law of attraction joke. Well done. <laughs> a small city, anyway. Yeah, this 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 is this is like going back to stereotypes from the 1950s when I grew up, and trust me, not a good time. Yeah, now, they refer to this as the divine energy of the male and female, which is interesting because the New Agers don't really ascribe to the Wiccan belief of the male and female godhead or the duality of that or what have you. And I think this is what happens when you try to adopt these principles from things like the Tao or something from Wicca or what have you, and you don't really incorporate that belief set. The notion of the Tao is that you have these different cyclic energies. Now, it's not restricted to male and female, although the male and female is what the New Agers really latch onto this notion of these two polar opposites. Now, in with that, with the, through the yin yang sign and what have you, there's the you know the little element of the opposite in there, but it's portrayed as this tiny little dot. You know, you have your little dot of black and the white, and your little dot of white and the black and what have you. But this is supposed to be a cyclic thing, a rotation. It represents things like the seasons, and there's a give and take there. And this can be seen as an internal thing, too, that we are all these things, and it's trying to find the harmony in oneself between these varied elements, between being this, you know, the skeptic as well as the sage or what have you. When I was in the 
pagan days. The best description for it that I was given was the divine is the diamond and all the facets are the aspects, the god or goddess, the male and the female. It's a just an aspect. It's not the complete thing, so it's not a division of these aspects. There's this strong element that's promoted of the notion of I am this or I am that or even more so you must be this or you must be that. And people come to all these weird conclusions based on that. Personally, I mean, I refer to myself as being gender fluid. And I think everyone is gender fluid. And this, this idea of male energy and female energy in general, to me, seems really silly. And like you, just, like you said, I mean, it's really it's based on these gender role constructs that go back, you know, to like Victorian time. This whole idea of, of masculinity and men with this unyielding kind of strength. I mean, it, it's just really silly, and I, it leads to a lot of problems. People have issues, particularly men, uh, because they're not allowed to express um, certain things. It, it causes all kinds of problems in society and in their lives. So I think if we allowed people to allow their gender to flow naturally the way it does, you'll see a breakdown of that whole the whole macho man image that so many people seem to depend on, and, and not just men, uh, women, they seem to de depend on this idea, you know, this this imaginary construct of, of what a man is. I, I think that would be awesome. better off. I think this is a societal issue we have. A lot of children from a young age are told, you must act this way, you must act that way. You know, men, yo, you shouldn't be showing emotion. It's not that men aren't emotional, which is essentially what this kind of concept promotes is that men tend not to be emotional. So it's kind of beaten out of us at a young age. With women, the idea of, you know, sitting there and going through and building things or what have you, um, doing more what we typically refer to as manual work, you know, lifting boxes and moving things around. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's, that's men's work. This whole paradigm is just a load of crap, and it always really has been. Yet a woman acts a certain way, and we will refer to her as butch or this or that and all these insults. And if a man acts a certain way, then it's sissy, yada, yada, yada. And this is the problem, is we're being shoved into these boxes of these paradigms. Here's a, have you ever um, been hanging out with one of your male friends and uh, decided to drop your pants and say, hey, look at the new underwear I got. Aren't these cool? <laughs> well, not exactly that, but I, I was commenting before we went online. There have been moments that I'm just sitting there hanging out with a male friend and had this, moment, this momentary feeling of attraction, and I'm like, okay, that was weird. It passes, and it's not something that's any kind of sexual interest for me. But at the same point, there have been these moments of this strong connection, ident you know, identifying with them and this kind of stuff that it's like, okay, that, that was interesting. So now, I, remember, I say that I'm completely you know, X or Y on this paradigm, I'd say no. Yeah, I, I remember when I was, when I was a kid, um, my mom having friends that she was close enough with that she would have no problem pulling her shirt off and saying, hey, look at my new bra, and look at the way it fits over here, and here, feel this, and pull on my strap, isn't this nice, and that kind of stuff. And, and it's nothing, it was no big deal. And then they could hug, and they could kiss, and, and they could, you know, there was physical contact between women that was deemed completely natural, normal, and socially acceptable. But a guy, I think women are a little bit less sexually repressed than ma males in terms of society. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it's completely frowned upon for men to to have any physical contact with another man outside of sporting events or shaking hands. Yeah. That's uh, pretty. I think that honestly, I think that's a sign of a sick society. In one of the gospels, in the original, it's uh, Jesus asks Peter or Paul, I believe, do you love me three times? And then the original, or whatever, the Greek that it was written, it had three different versions of love. Now, what Shadow, you were talking about just that weird feeling moment that you have a love for this other person, male, in this yeah. case. It feels a little weird, but it's not at the same time, because the love is there. You just uh, unconditionally allowed yourself that moment of feeling that form of love, love of brother, love of friendship, love, all together brings about a much greater form, but separate 
in their own. And Deb, going back to uh, what you were saying, I remember being raised kind of androgynous in a way. Uh, my father is, was a closeted gay man, and I remember having an androgynous doll with its own brush and everything. And I ad identify straight, but how I put it is there's just not been any man that's turned my crank. But I'm not by curious. Right, and, and when we were talking earlier too, I pointed out that I have had moments of just intense love for someone that, that I know, a friend that I'm talking to, but this is not someone I wanted to have sex with and not someone I wanted a romantic relationship with. It was just this wonderful friend. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also pointed out, although I am, as far as sexuality goes, I am a lesbian. I'm attracted predominantly to women. I am bi-romantic. I have had romantic relationships, and can have romantic relationships with men and women. I'm just not particularly interested in, in sleeping with men. I, I wouldn't rule it out simply because I don't think you can rule out any variety of, of human experience, well, most varieties of human experience, um, because you never know what's, what's going to happen. I've known a lot of women who've been you know, straight all their lives, and then they meet a woman and they fall in love with her. Yeah. And, and it doesn't necessarily change that they're heterosexual. They're still really heterosexual. They just happen to fall in love with a woman. We're more complicated than just gay, straight, male, female, um, cis, trans. Uh, any mm -hmm. kind of binary you want to create really doesn't exist. And those right. terms are only are, are the terms are useful. In, in you know trying to like navigate the world but you can't look at them as absolutes exactly I mean I, I look at uh, I come at the world that we are people first before anything gender identity name job doesn't matter you're a person because you're alive you are experienced you're on the journey of life um, and like it, I think Dev said it earlier, it's not how it naturally flows out. That's the aspect that I look at it, and I try to engage each person in that manner. The things that came up so far is love, and nature, and sex. And love is, isn't is something that I believe, isn't something that, that's been always with us as a species forever. I mean, I think romantic love is something that, that we've developed over time. Oh, definitely. Our nature is our nature, no matter what we do as individuals and as a species. And sex isn't really about love, but it's completely about our nature. Yeah. So we have this this we've, we've we've created this whole system in our societies where we've married these two things that don't necessarily belong together. And and I think it's healthy to separate those two things at least. Sometimes, because yeah, love I think isn't always you, about sex. Sex I isn't always about love. Exactly, Deb. Yeah. Sex isn't always about love. And oftentimes, sex is more about control. Or um, conquest, yeah. yeah. On either side of the equation. It's about dominance or submission. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a switch. <laughs> <laughs> well played. I'm speaking in more general terms. <laughs> But if you want to go there, let's not. Uh, not right now. Uh, <laughs> well, you've got the hat. Yes, I, I'm wearing deep, I'm wearing my goofy shaman's hat because it's fun. Because for this one, um, I I don't know. I thought I'd end up might potentially go a little bit more esoteric with it, but I don't think I need to. I mean, the the old paradigms are kind of falling away, and claiming this is because yeah. we're raising our female energy as a culture, this and that is still trying to force us back into these notions of strictly this is what is male and this is what is female and if you go down the list I mean aggression surrender come on females have a tendency to surrender not any ones I've ever known but then, then ascribing aggression to males not on some of the women I've dated but the <laughs> idea of separating yeah. sex from this nature so to speak I, I think that's a really good point because a lot of people when they're on the prowl, so to speak, and they're after some sex. A lot of the time, it's almost carnal by nature. It's not It's not about love. It's not necessarily about intimacy. It's about getting a fix more so. It's about getting that endorphin release yeah. or what have you. A lot of it seems to be that and just 
and a lot of people that calms them down. I was one of those people for the longest time that, you know, if I went, I started going about two weeks without, and I'd start getting neurotic <laughs> because you know my body was craving those chemicals, and yeah. sometimes it's as simple as that. But who we're attracted to is more our nature as opposed to that carnal aspect. And that separation is something that we don't really talk about. It's like, or don't tend to talk about as a society so much. People are going to be attracted who, to who they're attracted to. As an ex-girlfriend of mine used to say, some prefer the whole, some prefer the pole. And sometimes it's kind of as simple as that in terms of sexual interactions. And some don't prefer either, per se. Some like playing around with, you know, but this is a matter of preference to some degree in terms of what one enjoys and I think we need to embrace that part of our nature without having to categorize the hell out of each other. Nobody fits into the cubby holes we try to stick them in. Well, unfortunately I'd say that's in the one of the big damaging points to you know, culture and right down to our own personal psyches is from religion, uh, especially monotheistic. I mean the Catholics were horrendous with using sexuality as a bludgeon to do as we say. I mean, it's everything sinful is attributed to the body, to the desire, to the more quote-unquote animalistic side. This kind of phenomena, well, it's d dealt with differently, can also be seen in the New Age movement. And I'm going to reference a paragraph from the page I'm on that I'm using for reference today. Over many lifetimes, each male and female counterpart has been trying to bring his or her masculine and feminine energies into balance. This doesn't mean the woman has to be half feminine and half masculine. It means that she needs to fully develop her feminine characteristics while at the same time allowing her masculine side to grow and mature as well. The opposite holds true for men. What the hell? What was the name of the woman that um, you had as the subject that Jade and I were in? Madame Blavatsky? Oh, Madame Blavatsky? Yes, yes, thank you. It actually sounds very familiar of her early statings of it, how... It really is fairly close, and a lot of the New Age stuff is based upon some of her teachings, um, but one thing that's really worth noting is that in her travels, she learned things about Buddhism and what have you, and frankly, I think that she brought a very poor understanding of these things with her. Yes, definitely. But a lot of it seems definitely to have a true interior. And remember the time period, 1800. So the stereotypes are going to be set into that root dogma. But with the notion of the Tao and the yin and yang and what have you, these different energies, part of the notion is that each one of them flips and takes the other's place at times. So this is kind of how you get it, is that everybody has this dual aspect to themselves. And you can see more male or more female at different, depending on what's going on. And that kind of negates this whole paradigm to a degree, is that we have these aspects and we'll be act, acting in different aspects at different times. But this isn't the understanding that was brought to the West. My, my mere existence, I think, kind of destroys that paradigm. Yeah. <laughs> and that's part of why it was so important for me to try to get you or somebody with you know, a similar perspective into the room. Because the paradigm is, I think it's collapsing around us as our culture is changing and evolving. And it's taking time, but I think it's starting to collapse. It drives me crazy is I was reminded of this, and this is kind of going back a little bit. Um, I think Paranor said something about using, like, the gender roles to bludgeon each other. Yeah. Mm. I see a lot. I consider myself a feminist. Um, because I, you know, support gender equality, but there are aspects of, of the feminist movement, uh, individuals and small groups within the overall movement that are really skilled at using gender roles and and uh, you know traditional gender roles to bash men uh, in general. When they say things like, "Look at the state of the world today," you know, with all of the corruption and the war and all this stuff, this is all male stuff. This is men that did this, did this to us. And I mean, the only thing I could really think to even say to that is, no, that that's a human thing, yeah. because if women had been in charge all this time, we'd have the same problems. I really believe we'd have the same problems because it is completely human to go to war, it is completely human to be jealous, it is completely human to be greedy. This isn't a male thing. Um, we may choose to view our societies 
um, or you know, uh, pretend that only males or females have certain traits, but we all have them. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I was, of course, I'm definitely a feminist, and I was involved in the feminist movement in the 1970s. That gives you an idea. Um, and you would hear people talk about it. It was actually funny at the time, talk about how women wouldn't be any good at ruling a government, women would be too soft, and women would be, and at the time we would just look at people and go, um, Golda Meir, Indira yeah. Gandhi, uh, let's have this discussion again, hmm. uh, because no, uh, guess what, women can be in power and women can be really bad in power too, it's a human thing, you're absolutely right. Which is why I try to follow that everybody is a person first. Yeah, I mean, women can be just as ruthless as men. There's no reason why they couldn't or wouldn't be. Yeah, um, old my ear, Indira Gandhi. <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 I know some women personally who are actually more ruthless than any man I've ever known. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, it doesn't necessarily carry over to the entire gender. Um, so it, it's, you know, we've all got the same qualities. Yeah, and, and keep keeping the thought what was said just a few moments ago in terms of the, I, I guess I could say rad fans. Um, some of these people that are very much um, at the forefront of what people are referring to as feminism, but I don't think it's technically feminism. I think it's, you know, certain women that just seem to want to bash men more than anything else, as well as on the other side, some men that just want to bash women and claiming yeah. that it's some kind of, you know, we, we've been persecuted and what have you. Now, the women might be able to make a stronger case in this, but at the same point, many of them then turn around and promote the same gender-based stereotypes when they're making these arguments, and that's a problem. Historically speaking, the, these new women, these radical feminists who do that, I mean, there's a case to be made for, for some of the things that they're saying. Uh, and to say, to say that there's not is completely dishonest. I mean, yeah... Yeah, women historically have gotten the raw end of the deal, while while men have absolutely, you know, bathed in privilege. And 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 and, and yeah, men in general have really fucked things up. So a lot of these radical type feminists that, that do a lot of the screaming, there's a case to be made. They're just going about it, I think, in a, in a harmful, detrimental way. It's um, always the method. What frustrates me is, um, while I'm going after the New Agers, there are certain people that I have as my proverbial poster children for the New Age movement. People with a long following and this and that. and Most of them just drive me nuts, but every once in a while, one of them will make sense. And in the video that preceded this one, um, in my Power of Woo, four, what, 5A, I guess it is, when I was talking about this notion of gender-based energies, uh, Kill Swan's video on it was actually pretty darn good in general. And this almost frustrates me because she's one I like to poke fun at because I think she's kind of an <laughs> up-and-coming cult of the video. But she was saying that it is it shouldn't be seen as we need to raise the feminine energy in society, but we need to bring both up until they're both equal. And I think that'd be a much better approach to looking at this. And she was willing to speak out against the current paradigm, even as promoted within the New Agers. And I think we need more people that are willing to sit there and say, you know, you're going about this wrong. We need to bring both up so that they're equal instead of trying to shove one down to make the other one more equal. I think it would be more accurate to say it's better to uh, remove the restrictions on the energies and not lift either one of them up. Yeah, yeah, um, that too. Yeah. You know, restrictions. Allow the person to be themselves. Yeah, and stop telling them what they must be based upon some arbitrary gender that they were born with. Yeah, just be. Just be. Yeah. 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 It'll probably stop half the mental illnesses. <laughs> well, I don't know about half, but there's a good number of them that I, I think might be remedied by this. Yeah. I mean, well, I, do, I know I would not have gone through what I went through if not for biases in that way. I think that might be a wrap, y'all. Unless somebody has anything further to add, I think we've got most of the ground covered. End the woo. Nothing End. profound. <laughs> End the woo and tell the Christians to stop being douchebags. Um, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And the MRAs and the rad fans and the yeah, no ragers. It was funny. I just said about the rad fans, about the case to be made about some of the stuff they scream about. And 
I never went after MRA groups, although I think that you know the MRAs and, and MGTOWs and all that stuff, that stuff drives me crazy, and I think most of them are really full of shit. Mm -hmm. but even then, there's a case to be made for some of the things that they talk about. And yeah. what pisses me off about them is they do a worse job than the radical feminists when it comes to making their case because they'll bring up the point that they could possibly make a case for, and then they use it as a weapon to attack feminists. And it's like you've completely lost your credibility now. Nobody wants to hear your point because you're an asshole. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Nothing explaining shit. Yeah, I mean, there's a, some of it is absolute bullshit, but for some of the things that they talk about, there's a case to be made. It's definitely, you know, some areas worth dis discussion and looking at. But why bother when the people that you're going to be dealing with are more worried about feminists yeah. than they are the actual issue that they're supposedly engaging? Well, in my case, being a male that has two children um, living in Texas, basically my ex would have to be an axe murderer for um, a lot of the judges around here to even consider letting me have custody over her because of varied cultural paradigms. Now, this this is a actual, you know, reasonable complaint that could be made, but these aren't the ones that are promoted. It's, instead, it's just, you know, we're going to sit there and say that these people are the other side is this and the other side is that, instead of saying this is an issue that we think should be addressed. And as Jade, who participated in some of the early feminist movement, back in the day they would have been fighting for men's right to be able to have the kids as much as they'd be fighting for varied issues on the female, on the women's side. And there's, we did. Yeah, and then there's still, in the, in the feminist movement, there are still aspects of it where they talk about you know, men's issues and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, they get drowned out by all the crazies. On both sides, yeah. You know, I mean, it's one of the things that you hear a lot of uh, the men's rights people talk about is, you know, why are you know women, you know, uh, equally in the armed forces? You know, they don't have to do the selective service thing, and you know, they can't be drafted, and you know, why is this left up to the men? But that's actually changing, and it's women who are changing it. So and, you know, and, when they and, make and, that, that argument, they're shooting themselves in the foot. And who made the rules in the first place? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Back, back in 1970, we were arguing that if you're going to draft men, you should draft women. Feminists were arguing that. Now, frankly, we were all against drafting anyone, but mm -hmm. we felt that you know, if you're going to draft men, you're going to draft women. And people said, well, what can women do? And we said, well, pretty much anything yeah. a man could do. Well, they can't <laughs> fight on the front lines. And I, I just kind of brought up World War II. Uh, when so many women were in the armed forces, and women like my mother, who were not technically in the war armed forces, and so didn't get any benefits, nevertheless wore a uniform and went to work at an army base every day, and did a job that under other circumstances would have been done by a regular army member. There were a lot of women like my mother who were not officially in the armed services, and yet they were. Queen Elizabeth was a mechanic in World War II. And that's it for tonight's discussion group. I hope you all enjoyed it. Have a good night. I want a penis. Thanks for watching.